Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at verse 23, from the King James text I read as we stand in honor of the reading of God's word. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith that we might be justified, I'm sorry, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus, and if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. I have this morning a simple word of exhortation. This is not a full-blown, what I call a full-blown sermon. This is just a word of exhortation that God laid in my spirit. And the Lord specifically, when he spoke this to me, he said, I want you to deliver this when the fellas come down from up north. And uh, so fellas, for some reason, God laid this on my heart. So I think there's something special in here for you. I want to talk to us this morning on the topic of lessons from our older sister. Lessons from our older sister. Master, we thank you, God, for your word today, for it is exalted above all else. When everything else has withered and faded, the word of our God shall stand forever. And Lord Jesus, as the word of God would go forth at this hour to encourage and to bless, to uplift and to inspire, we just pray, God, that your anointing would rest upon your servant. Help me, Lord, to deliver every word and every thought that you'd have me to deliver, that the people of God might leave this place uh, walking on air, knowing that they've been in the presence of God and hearing from heaven. Grant it, we pray, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God. And amen. You may be seated today. Uh, for those of you that were here a few weeks back, you remember I preached a message relative to Leah yes. and Rebecca, the wives of Jacob. Uh, Rachel, I'm sorry, I, I did it last time too, didn't I? <laughs> All these are names that unfortunately half of them are in my family. So I wind up saying the wrong names because I'm sick of all these kids we've got running around with Rachel and Rebecca and all these names. But uh, Leah and Rachel. I'm telling you, I'm going to get it right. <laughs> and you remember that the message I delivered some weeks ago concerning these two ladies, I spoke of the fact that this was a type and an example of the church. Yes, that's right. Amen. You see, Jacob worked and worked and worked in order to have beautiful Rachel, but his... Uh, father-in-law put a little stunt on him and he wound up getting first Leah. Yes. And he had to work again in order to get the one he really wanted. Yes, amen. And I talked about the fact that God made a covenant with Israel. But Israel is not what God really wanted. What God really wanted was the church. Hallelujah. What God really wanted was you and I. What God really wanted was people that believed in Him and loved Him and cared for Him because of what He did for them. That's right. Amen. And not people who did it out of obligation. Yes. Amen. That's right. So you see, God first got Leah. Yes. He got Israel. Amen. But then the one he really wanted was the church. Yes, amen. And he just worked and did what was necessary on the cross of Calvary yes, to get the church. Amen. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? Amen. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit, building off of that message, in a sense, I want to talk to you a little bit today about lessons from our older sister, Israel. Ah. You see, a lot of Christians, we don't understand the role or the place that Israel has in today's world. Because we feel like, well, the church 
has become, according to what Paul has written in Galatians, we've become the heirs of Abraham's promise, haven't we? We've become the true heirs. We're the rightful heirs. We're the one God wanted. And all of a sudden it's like, well, doesn't Israel then kind of become unnecessary? Doesn't, you know, she doesn't have a real role anymore if we become the preeminent figure, so to speak. But no, she's not. You can't just do away with Israel. You can't just throw away Israel. I have a problem. You heard me say this in my last verse. I have a problem with preachers that get up and preach how that Israel is God's favored nation and how that uh, Israel is, you know, God's blessed nation. And y'all, I got news for you. The church is God's favored nation. The church is God's blessed nation. My Bible tells me that you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Hello now. I'm here to tell you today, God's church is God's favored nation. If God's going to show anybody favor, if God's going to show anybody blessing, it's going to be the church. Yes, amen. You hear what I'm telling you today? The nation of Israel is like Lega. It, it is kind of a secondary figure to the church. It takes a back seat to the church. But does it still serve an important function? Well, yes, it does, because she's the older sister. In our primary text today, the Apostle Paul said that up until faith came, we were under the law, and under the law, we had a schoolmaster. We had a school teacher. Yes, sir. Well, I've got news for you. That school teacher may be retired, but she can still teach. Amen. Do you hear what I'm telling you? There are still lessons that we can learn from Israel. Yes. Even today, in today's world. See, we look, preachers preach from the Old Testament, and we draw lessons from the Old Testament, and we draw all these wonderful, inspirational thoughts from the Old Testament. I've got news for you. We can draw lessons from Israel today. Amen. Okay. Don't you think that when all... Jacob had his two wives there. Don't you think that Leah was still the older sister to her sister? That's right. Amen. Don't you think that she still would say to her sister, well, no, when you want to make a meatloaf, you do it like this. Yes. Come on now. Amen. Well, you know, I've learned in the time that I've been with Jacob that he likes his stuffed peppers done this way. Hello now, do you hear what I'm telling you? You can still learn lessons from the older sister because an older sister is always going to be your older sister. Yeah. And I tell them the truth today. Amen. So there are lessons that we still today can learn from Israel. And wait till you hear the one I got for you. It's going to glory. See, the Lord is supporting me now. The nation of Israel stands today as a telegraph station or a telephone booth, if you will, for the church of Jesus Christ. It is the land of promise whose very soil once knew the gentle footsteps of our Creator. It is the land which absorbed the sacred blood of God's Messiah on the hill that we call Calvary. It is a place with great history, but it is also a place with an unprecedented future. When God has something to say, you can be sure that the hotline from heaven's throne will be ringing in Israel's holy hills. That's why all the prophecies in the last times surround Israel. That's why when you read the prophecies concerning the Lord's return, so many of them are focused in Israel. Why? Because that's our telephone booth to heaven. That's our telegram. That's where God sends messages to the church through. That's how the church knows what's coming and what's going on is based on what's happening to and in Israel. Do you follow what I'm saying today? Yeah. All right, now we're getting there. Uh, when the enemies of Israel attempt to strike her from the face of the earth, as the Arab nations to this day would like to do, our God will come to her defense and preserve her existence. Why? Because the truth shall forever stand firm. Listen to me now. This is an exciting thought. God's church may be attacked. It may be hated and it may be schemed against but it cannot be wiped off the face of this planet. 
Therefore, because God's church cannot be defeated, it's not the other way around. Because God's church cannot be defeated, Israel cannot be defeated. Because Israel stands as a type for the church. Hallelujah! Do you hear what I'm telling you today? And because God's people are victorious, Israel will be victorious. Hallelujah! Now, isn't that an exciting thought? Huh? We haven't even got into this yet. I'm just scheming my way through the potatoes. We're going to get to the meat in a minute. My Lord have mercy. As goes the fate of Israel, so goes the fate of God's church. God speaks to his church today by reason of the experiences of Israel. Just as he speaks to the church by reason of the experiences of Leah and Rachel. The elder sister can still teach the younger a few things. In 1967, a war was fought in the Middle East. It was called and is brought down in history as the Sixth Day War of June 1967, engaged in by Israel and her Arab neighbors, notably Hussein of Jordan and Nasser of, uh, Nasser of Egypt. And I want you to know that this war which occurred in 1967, just a couple of years after this preacher was born, this war holds for the church today some very important lessons. And I want to share them with you this morning. It was the United Arab Nations who joined with Egypt and began to build up forces near the Israeli border threatening invasion. You know, the enemy always likes to look menacing, but seldom does he have the nerve to actually carry out his threats. It matters little how visible the preachers, the churches, and ministries appear that would condemn you to hell without any hope of salvation because of who you are. It doesn't matter how visible they are. I don't care if they're on television, on every radio station. It doesn't matter how many of them there are. And if you feel outnumbered and overwhelmed, my friend, the reality today is half the time the enemy is terrified to carry out his threat. Amen. All these Arab nations gathered together and they bordered themselves along the Israeli border and it looked as though the uh, threat of invasion was imminent and yet they just stood there. <laughs> yes. That's right. They just stood there, didn't move. They just stood there, and everybody was looking to Nasser of Egypt as the leader of this coalition. And they're saying, well, when are we going to go in, and when are we going to wipe the nation of Israel off the face of the map? And they were getting impatient. Say, when are we going to do this thing? You know, there's a lot of people in the church today, there's a lot of preachers out there today preaching all kinds of trash about certain people. Amen. And all they had their way, they they re legislate us right out of existence, wouldn't they? If they had their way, they'd go to Washington and write us right out of existence. But honey, just watch how much their guns flap compared to how quickly they get their job done. Hello now. Watch and see how so many of these false prophets can stand there and they can they can bark. But there's no bite. That's right. Because in reality, they can't do what all they're talking about. So they talk about it. They like to scare. They like to intimidate. But my friend, they haven't got the power. Because why? Because God's not behind them. That's right. Amen. Hello now. Because God is not behind them. He's behind somebody else. And if he's behind the guy that you're coming up against, then honey, I don't want to be on your team. Yes. Amen. If the Lord's behind the other guy, you better watch out. You're going to have trouble. David may have been a lot smaller than Goliath, but the difference was his father was standing behind him, and he was a lot bigger than the giant. Hallelujah. So you better watch out when God is on the other guy's team. You better go home with your ball because it ain't time to play. That's right. Amen. Amen. And I'm here to tell you today, the enemy loves to intimidate. He loves to bark. Amen. But what's sad is there are so many people in our community today who have become convinced and condemned because the enemy is gathering at the border. That's right. Yes, oh, but there's so many of them. 
They're far more than we have. There are far more who preached against us than preached for us. Yeah, that's right. We're gonna we're gonna get wiped out. What they what they're saying must be true. No, just because there's more of them saying it doesn't mean it's so. That's right, amen. If you remember in the Old Testament, we read about the prophet Elijah taking the prophets of Baal up to Mount Carmel, and the scriptures tell us that there were hundreds to one. Yes. Come on now. There was one preaching the message of the one true God of Israel. And there were hundreds who were representing Baal. But did their numbers make them right? No, because God was behind the one. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you today, children, if you'll get on this boat, you'll find out that God is behind you. And the enemies may clatter. They may make a lot of racket and a lot of noise. They may gather at the border, but they cannot move. They cannot do anything because God is behind you. And his invisible hand will stand between them and you. Amen. Oh, glory. <laughs> yes, preacher. I'm reminded of the story in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 15 to 17, when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, and host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? What are we going to do? And he answered, Fear not. Listen now. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Ah, yes. Yes, amen. Now, I don't know about you. Elisha, but I'm seeing two of us. <laughs> and I'm seeing hundreds of them. How in the world are you going to tell me that those that are with us are more than that are with them? How are you going to tell me when a little tiny church that's half empty this morning that those that are with us are more than those that are with Rod Parsley, with his church with thousands, and more than that are, than that are with John Hagee and his church filled with thousands? How are you going to tell me that there are more with us than are with them? Yes, amen. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. Oh, glory. And he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about. Listen. Elisha, hallelujah, those chariots weren't there for the city, they were there for Elisha, hallelujah to God. I'm here to tell you, the city of Dallas is surrounded by angels today, and if they're not there for Dallas, they're there for us, hallelujah to God. Glory to God, those that be with us are more than they that are against us. So don't get nervous just because the enemy is gathering at the border. They like to intimidate. They like to try to strike fear into your heart. But only a fool would let them. Because those that be with us are far more than they that be against us. The chariots may have encompassed that city, but they were there specifically for Elijah. God may have angels deployed to speak to, protect, and reclaim our community today as a whole. The child of God, they're there today, especially for you. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Israel, how did they respond to the gathering of their enemies at the border? While the enemy stood there, all of their soldiers in tents and tanks in place and all these weapons of war. How did Israel respond? Did it shrink? Did it cower? That's what too many Christians do. That's what too many people in the GLBT communities do. We get afraid and we cower and we shrink. But no, Israel said, well, no dummy's going to stand there forever. Let's get this war going. We'll strike first. Amen. We'll throw, we'll throw the first punch. And that way, we'll go ahead and get this thing here. If we're going to fight, bless God, we're going to fight. But we're going to get this thing in gear. We're going to get it going. 
So all of a sudden, Israel, woo, glory, Israel put its airplanes in motion and they sent their bombers over into Egypt and in one fell swoop, because Egypt never expected this, in one fell swoop, in one afternoon, they completely annihilated the entire air force of the enemy. They had no air power from the first day because Israel had enough sense to strike first. Yes. Children, you listen to me today. If we have enough sense to tear in and go after the enemy instead of cowering and waiting for the enemy to come after us, why do you think this church exists today? Why do you think this ministry exists today? Why do you think we've got over a dozen websites on the internet reaching out to people that other churches don't want to reach out to, bringing a message to people that other churches want to condemn and criticize? I'm here to tell you, it's because I'm not just going to step back and wait for the enemy to come after me. This not, I'm going to take the offensive. I'm going to do something. I'm going to get out there and make the information available to people. I'm going to make this information uh, uh, available to souls that are lost so that we can begin to reclaim those that are lost and dying without God. I don't have time to sit back and wait for the devil to do what he's going to do. Baby, I'm on the offensive today. I'm doing. Amen. We're stepping out for God. We're doing. We're doing the job. You look around and say, well, you ain't got that fancy a church. Yeah, but we got a church, haven't we? Yes, amen. Amen. My Bible said where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Honey, we got a quorum. That's right. That's all it takes. You know, it's an old song we used to say in the Church of God that said, One man and God can triumph over a thousand. Yes, amen. One man and God puts Satan on the run. Amen. So take courage, weary soldier. Lift up your head and see one man and God yes. can bring the victory. Hallelujah. It don't take a whole lot. Amen. It just takes folks that know where to strike. Yes, amen. You hear what I'm telling you? It takes people who know. I'll tell you what I said when I first started Grace Oasis Ministries in 1993. I said, you know where it's happening today? I'll tell you where it's happening. It's happening on the Internet. Yes. That's where everybody goes, especially in the GLBT community. When they want information, when they're looking for something, that's where they go. Yes. A baby in the last 15 years, we've posted dozens and dozens of messages to the internet. I get emails from people in Honduras. I get people email from people in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. I get email from people in Japan. I get email from people around the world who are struggling with issues and they're wrestling and they're fighting. And they say, "Brother, I came across your site. I've been listening to your messages. I've been reading your Bible studies. I've been reading the articles that." you've written and you have no idea how much they've helped me that's right amen because i'm not going to sit back and wait for the enemy to do his thing that's right. no god's church in the cowering church it's an offensive church right. it amen. steps out and does and just like israel in the six-day war i'm gonna get out there and i'm gonna hit on the front line i'm gonna do i'm gonna play smart the best place to be first of all is on the internet in today's world. That's the best place to be. And boy, I'll tell you, I've worked myself, and you all know it's the truth, I've worked myself crazy making sure we have a presence on the internet. I'm going to tell you, you can't go anywhere without finding something about us. That's right. <laughs> and I'm not talking about finding our church. I'm talking about finding the information that you need yes, amen. to come to terms with who you are amen. as a child of God. I've got web communities on Hotmail. I've got them on Yahoo. I'll put them on Yippee I -A -I -A -O if they ever open one up. I've got websites all over the place. We've got them linked up, hooked up, rigged up, every which way but upside down. Because one way or the other, if you're looking for the information and the help that you need, you're going to find it. Because we put it out there. That's right. This is one reason that I've said so many times that I get bugged when people benefit from this ministry but don't feel the least bit to support it. We get a lot of that. Got a fellow up in Michigan, he said, we don't have a church up here. And this is a fellow I used to pastor who told me he was going to come to Dallas because God spoke to him. I told you all about that. 
the same fella. All of a sudden he called me and said, the Lord spoke to me and I'm going to start tithing to your ministry. Because your ministry is so important, it needs to be out there. I said, okay. He did it for about two weeks and then he quit. All of a sudden, you know, he needed the money for something else or whatever and he quit. And you know, it bugs me. It bugs me because there are people in our community out there that don't see the value in what we are doing. You go to a lot of church websites in our, uh, from our community. And do you know who that who is going to benefit from their website? Anybody that lives within a 20 mile radius of their church. Because all the website does is tell you about their church, how to get there, what time they have church. Hello now. We've got websites out there that have articles, that have Bible studies, that articulate not only issues relative to GOBT issues, but at the same time we've got websites and articles and Bible studies that articulate the oneness of God, that articulate Jesus' name, baptism. We've got information out there, my friend, that even oneness churches don't have on their websites available for people. If you want to hear it, you'd have to come into their church to hear it. We've got it right there for you. Hello now. Because we're not trying to just lead people into our local church. What we're trying to do is give people the information, give folks the gospel, let them do with it what they will. But we're going to give them the information. When they stand before God in the judgment, they will be without excuse. So is it important that folks support and help this ministry? You better believe in this, because I don't know if there are many that are doing what we're doing. Because we're not just standing back on the sidelines waiting for the devil to come attack. We're out there on the front lines doing everything in our power to enlighten people and to bring people the liberty that comes in knowing the truth. Amen. Israel had the sense to strike first. Not to simply wait for the enemy to invade, but instead going after their airfields and their aircraft with a vengeance in the early morning hours of the first day of conflict. We can sit back today and wait for the enemy to attack, or we can take the offensive and disable him at the knees. There's an old saying, knowledge is power. By putting that information out there, we're empowering people. You hear me now? By putting that information, we are empowering people. We're cutting the enemy off at the knees. Because knowledge is power. We have the power today to be a mighty first strike force. And not merely to hold our ground. Amen. A lot of folks think the church is just supposed to hold its ground. No, baby, we're supposed to be out there taking territory. Amen. Not defending territory. Did you hear me today? We're supposed to be taking new ground, not merely defending what little piece of ground we have today. The word of the Lord tells us in Matthew chapter 16, 17, and 18. He had asked the question, who do men say that I am? And his disciples told him, and he said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And this was the Lord's response to him. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I also say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Honey, Gates do not move. That's right. Amen. Gates do not come after you. Gates do not strive to take new ground. Gates are there to protect ground that they've already got. The devil thinks he's got the GLBT community behind the gates of hell. And I'm here to tell you this morning, Jubilee said, not so long as we've got breath. Hallelujah. Because the gates of hell cannot prevail against us. We are not merely guarding the ground that we have. We have every intention of taking ground and taking back that ground which the enemy has claimed as his own. Amen. Hallelujah. Wow. Glory to God. Woo. I like the promise of God in Isaiah 54 verse 17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. No weapon. 
that I don't care if it's a gun, a tank, an airplane, or a bomb, it will not prosper. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. But listen, it didn't end there. Here's the important part of the promise. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. Hallelujah. Have you ever felt like there's tongues out there wagging that have risen up in judgment of you? God said, thou shalt condemn by reason of your life, by reason of your experience with God, by reason of what you're doing and how you're living. You are going to condemn them where they stand. Because one day they're going to stop and they're going to look and they're going to see a church up in Dallas, Texas, where the Holy Ghost is moving like the Holy Ghost hadn't moved in a hundred years and it's going to be full of all kind of folks that they don't even think ought to be in church. It's going to be full of all kind of folks that they don't even think have the right to serve God. It's going to be full of all kind of folks that they are accustomed to condemning and criticizing and judging. Yes, amen. But all of a sudden they're going to stand there just like Peter, as he stood in the house of Cornelius with his Jewish friends, and they're going to look and say, who are we to judge? God's given them the Holy Ghost just like he did us. God's doing for them just like he did us for us. Who are we to judge? Who are we to condemn? That's right, he did. And every tongue that speaks against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. My Lord, have mercy. What a promise. But listen, i got to finish this verse because it's a good one. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness, listen to me now, you holding this high-haired, long sleeve, folks, you listen to me now. And their righteousness is of me. Yes, they do. Your righteousness has nothing to do with what you put on this morning. Come on now. That's right. And it doesn't have nothing to do with what you took off the day you got saved. That's right. Our righteousness is of Him. Amen. Amen. My Bible said all our righteousness is before the Lord as filthy rags. Every bit of it. It's not a thing you can do in and of yourself to make yourself, quote, holy, to make yourself, quote, sanctified, to make yourself, quote, separated from the world. There's not a thing you can do that puts you in a good standing with God. The only thing that puts you in a good standing with God is embracing His promise, trusting Him, believing Him. And knowing, like Abraham, that that which he has promised, he is also able to perform. And God said, one day I'm going to pick you up from this planet, and I'm going to clean you up, and I'm going to sanctify you like you ain't never been sanctified. And you're going to be so holy and so righteous that sexuality and relationships aren't even going to be an issue anymore. The Bible said, we're after the resurrection, we'll neither be married nor given in marriage. All of a sudden, brother, we're going to be so sanctified that it ain't, it ain't even going to matter to us anymore. That's right, you did. Because human sexuality, the need for relationships, the need for that social connection and that emotional bond, that's a flesh and blood need. That's right, amen. That's a need that's attached to our humanity. That's right. But you see, I'm not perfect today, but I'm sure on the road for the day when God gets ready to perfect us. Hello now. I'm on the road for the day when God's going to do the job. And everything He's promised... He's going to perform. And like Abraham, I believe God. I believe that if he said it, he can do it. That's right. Amen. The problem is we've got people running around thinking that they can achieve it on their own in the here and now. And there's a problem with that because you try to do it on your own. The Bible says that if you embrace even one little tiny part of the law, you become subject to it in its entirety. Oh, my Lord. So you go back to the Old Testament, well, a man ought not to, or a woman ought not to wear clothes pertaining to a man, and blah, blah, blah. Unless God, that comes right out of the law. Yeah, that's right. Guess what? You better be worshiping on the Sabbath. Uh -huh. That's right. Guess what? You better not be going to steak and sword and having you a lobster dinner. 
Come on now. You better not be cooking two kinds of meat and serving them for dinner on Thanksgiving. You can't have turkey and ham. Oh, ham? Oh, Jesus, no. <laughs> Do you follow what I'm saying today, folks? The Bible said if you embrace one part of the law, you become subject to it all. And there's a lot of belief systems. I don't care if you're Jehovah's Witness, Pentecost, or what you are. There's a lot of belief systems out there that they're borrowing a lot of their junk from the law. And they don't realize that they're going to be standing before God one day and wrote the words and say, okay. Let's take this grace book and set it aside because it don't apply to you. Huh? <laughs> Lord, what do you mean? It don't apply to you. No, 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 no. See, y'all thought it was real keen to pursue the law. And for that reason, I've got to judge you by the law. How do you like that? Listen to me today. The Word of God declares, Who shall separate us from the love of God in Christ? So tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Listen, yea, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now, I'm a whisper, so you'll listen to me and you'll pay real good attention says we are more than conquerors. Conquerors do not defend. Ah, yes. Oh, hallelujah. You hear me today? Yes, amen. Conquerors do not defend. That's right. Got a lot of people in our community that they're constantly on the defense. They're constantly defending themselves. Baby, you ain't got nothing to apologize for. You have got nothing in this world you need to defend yourself for. I'm here to tell you today we are more than conquerors. That means you just do what you're going to do. You take what territory you need to take. You claim what ground you need to claim. And devil be damned if he gets in the way. Yes, amen. Because I am more than a conqueror, hallelujah, through Christ. He didn't say we're conquerors. He said we're more than conquerors. And there's not one conqueror. You can look back in history. There's not one conqueror that said his, pitched his tent in Rome and said, Bless God, nobody's going to take Rome away from me. That's right. No, sir. No, sir. They marched in the other cities. They marched into other lands. They marched into other countries. And they claimed new territory. And they made it part of their kingdom. I'm here to tell you, we're marching through the land of Gainville today. And we're going to claim some territory. Hallelujah. We're going to claim some souls for the kingdom of God. We're going to pitch our flag and let the devil know that once was his, is no longer his. It now belongs to Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Woo, folks, I'd be shouting by now. Yes, amen. I am about shouting by now. <laughs> yes. A conqueror is not a defensive soldier or a warrior. He is an offensive general. That's right, amen. A conqueror goes out and claims territory and countries that were otherwise not his. Children, God has made us more than conquerors. Those areas that are meant to make us believe that we have no place in God and cannot possibly be the recipient of His love and grace are only obstacles designed for us to overcome and subdue by faith in His righteousness. Did you hear me? All those things that stand in the way, they're supposed to trip you up. God put them there. The devil didn't put them there. God put them there. Because he made you more than a conqueror. He said, now, climb over it, climb under it, climb around it, but baby, climb. I remember preaching a message some years back in Connecticut while I was there. And I had a milkshake on the pulpit for McDonald's with a lid on it. And I handed it to somebody. I said, okay, now go ahead and drink that for me. He said, I don't have a straw. I said, okay, go ahead and drink it. I 
don't have a straw. So I took the medicine, carried it up to the pulpit, took the lid off, threw it into the middle of the sanctuary, and said, take the lid off. Yeah, amen. I'm here to tell you, GLBT community, that the church tries to tell you you can't get through the straw. That's all right. I don't need the straw. See, straw rhyme, rhymes with law. I don't need the law. I don't need the straw. I'll just take the lid off. There's more than one way to skin a cat. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. You see, those obstacles, God put them there so that you'd find a way by faith around them. He's made you more than a conqueror. Hallelujah. So don't let it block you. Don't let it hold you up. Conquer it. Overcome it. Get around it. Get past it. Amen. You hear me today? Oh, glory. During the Six Day War, I'm almost done. During the Six Day War, listen to this now. This is funny. <laughs> the Arabs, the enemy of Israel, broadcast a series of false reports as the battle began to rage. Oh, we downed this many Israeli jets. They hadn't downed a one. <laughs> We killed this many Israeli soldiers hadn't shot a one. We blown up this many Israeli tanks hadn't blown up nothing. Not even a balloon. <laughs> oh, but on Arab radio, there the message went out, and the Arabs were all rejoicing. They were winning the battle. Honey, they were being beaten so miserably it wasn't even funny. Yes, that's right. There may be people out there who like to dance in the aisles when a preacher gets up and preaches GLBT people, people into hell. That's right. But sweetheart, that don't mean the message on their radio is the right message. Do you hear what I'm telling you? That's right. Amen. That don't mean the enemy telling the truth. He's trying to keep his morale up. He's trying to keep his folks' morale up. That's yes. what he's trying to do. And he's passing all kinds of bad information in an effort to do it. But you want to hear what the sad part of it is? There were people in Israel. You see, the Israelis ordered complete radio silence. They said, we're not going to tell no good news. We're not going to tell no bad news. We're not going to tell no news at all. Why? We're not going to embolden the enemy by letting them know that we're whooping them silly. You hear me today? We're not going to let the enemy know we're whooping them up one side down the other because if we do, it'll just make them madder and make them want to fight harder. Hello now? That's right, yeah. You hear what I'm telling you? Yeah. Why do you think Jesus said so many times after a demoniac was delivered. Now, go home and don't tell nobody. Hello? Yeah. Or after somebody was healed, he'd say, now go and don't tell us all. Yeah. Well, Lord, why wouldn't I tell us How am I not going to tell him? <laughs> I used to be stretched out on the street, couldn't walk. All of a sudden, I'm walking into the market. How can I not tell him? <laughs> but sometimes... The best policy is silence. Yep. So you don't embolden the enemy to fight even harder. But here's the problem. We pray sometimes and God is silent. Hello, folks, do you know where I'm going? We pray sometimes and we don't get an answer from God and immediately we get to worry. Immediately we get to be concerned. Immediately we're, oh, Lord, you've abandoned me. Oh, God, you've given up on me. Oh, Jesus, help me more. Lord said, dummy. <laughs> We're in a state of radio silence. I don't want to involve in the enemy against you. That's right. So I'm going to be quiet. You be quiet to me. <laughs> but while you're being quiet, don't do this. Don't do what Israel did. A lot of people in Israel, guess what they did? They began to listen to the Arab radio. Oh, my God. They begin to listen to air radio. And as the reports come in, oh, all these jets were down, the, the Israelis are losing, they're being what They believed it. Yes. How many people in the church today are listening to the enemy's message and they're believing it? Hey, hey. Honey, he's a liar and the father of lies. He couldn't tell the truth if his life depended on it. Why are you believing the enemy? Hallelujah. Why are you listening to Arab radio? Amen. 
Amen. Well, because God didn't say anything to me. It's called radio silence. What? <laughs> My Lord, have mercy. Glory. I want to tell you today the truth is this. The enemy spreads lies and propaganda in an effort to muster the morale of his own doomed troops. Yes, that's right. You know, the devil's still telling people in the satanic movement that when this thing is all over, Satan's going to win. Yeah. You hear me? That's right. There are a lot of people on this planet that believe that when the final battle is fought, that Lucifer is going to win. That's what he tells them, and they believe it. Yeah. Now, are you going to believe that, or are you going to believe God? Well, there's preachers out there telling you because of who you are, you don't have a hope in hell of getting into heaven. Are you going to believe them, or are you going to believe God? I'm going to believe God. I don't trust God. I don't have time to listen to the enemy's radio. If God has spoken, I believe God. And God said, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Isn't that what it says? Amen. I got news for you, my friend. The enemy's got a lot of trash out there on the waves, but you can't afford to listen to it, and you certainly can't afford to believe it. Why then should we believe the hype or misreports which are hatched in hell, telling of victories where there have been no victories? That's right. Why should we? The Word of God tells us in 1 John 4, verses 1 through 3, Beloved, believe not every spirit. But try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth 